historian working at the University of Leeds, looking at the relationships between Jewishness and whiteness. And I'm also a young queen. It's so wonderful to see so many people here and I'm really glad that you've all come, come to listen. And so welcome. I'm going to start off with a fact, with a question. According to an Oxford University survey, what percentage of British adults last year said they had read or partially agreed with the statement, Jews have created coronavirus to collapse the economy for financial gain? Any ideas? Turns out it, were, it was actually 20%. 20% of British adults thought that agree or partially agree with the statement, Jews have created coronavirus to collapse the economy for financial gain. What does that tell, tell us about anti-Semitism? Well, it tells us that this plays quite a large role in society today. It's not something that's limited to a small number of people who do step along high streets. It's not just limited to people who's on the Jeremy Corbyn's Twitter. It's something that plays a large role in society today. It's important. It matters for understanding society. So what is anti-Semitism? Anti-Semitism, in its most simplest terms, is racism against Jews. It can be a form of religious discrimination, it can be both individual somebody who individually doesn't like Jews, has prejudiced ideas about Jews, um, or it can be structural. It's produced by the material conditions of, racist, of racial capitalist societies. April Rosenblum, the scholar of anti-Semitism writes, anti-Semitism or anti-Jewish oppression is a system of ideas passed down through a society's institutions that enables scapegoating of Jews and the ideological or physical targeting of Jews that results from that. Something specific that you need to know to understand anti-Semitism is that anti-Semites think of Jews as being simultaneously intermention, sort of racially or culturally or socially lesser people, and as being possessing some sort of supernatural power to control society. So anti-Semitism in its second part often manifests through conspiracy theories. Some of these are ridiculous, like the idea that forest fires are created by Jewish face lasers, which is something an American congresswoman said, or Ameri the American talk show host, Alex Jones, who declared they, meaning Jews, are turning the frigging frogs gay. But some of these are more prosaic. Anti-Semites might think Jews control the money supply. They might think Jews control the media or government or universities. Why do people think this? Why is it so powerful? And they think key to understanding anti-Semitism is understanding the role it plays within wider racial structures. Alana Lenton, a very senior scholar of anti-Semitism, writes that the political utility of anti-Semitism is not to illuminate the operations of race, but rather to obscure them. What does she mean? Well, anti-Semitism is racial capitalism, the combination of racial capitalism that structures most racial Western societies, it's racial capitalism's prevailing explanation for failure. And this is true both for the left and the, and the right. Ra to break this down further, racists believe that white people are naturally superior. They might define this culturally or ethnically or socially, literally white supremacy. And if they believe, if white people are so superior as they think, that begs the question, 
Why haven't they won? Why does stuff do go wrong? What are white supremacists fighting today? There's no real, there's no real explanation for failure within white supremacist and racial capitalist systems. The idea of Jews as a supernaturally powerful group provides this explanation for the failures of racial capitalism, which doesn't call into question the system as a whole. And this is true both, both across the political spectrum. Anti-Semitism is no different on the left or the right. So for the right, a Jewish conspiracy could be used to explain or delegitimize gender variance or black, or black protests or a multicultural society. They might argue that Soros is this George Soros, Jewish billionaire, is responsible for Black Lives Matter so that they don't have to engage with the way in which uh, Black Lives Matter is a response to racial violence. Or postmodernist neo-Marxist Jews are using academia to make people queer. And they don't, that means they don't have to engage with the way in which queerness calls into question heteropatriarchal society. They might, anti Semites might think that there's a small cabal of Jews exploiting you, controlling the money or the government. Um, they might blame these, a small cabal of Jews for the runs of global capitalism or the runs of global imperialism. And so anti-Semitism, what, what it does is it distracts us from the critique of capitalism and distracts us from the critique of global imperialism. So what connects anti-Semitism to queerphobia and to Islamophobia? Well, when anti-Semites say that Jews are plotting against Western civilization by pushing drugs to turn people gay, or they're using queerphobia to they're using queerphobia to build hatred of Jews and anti-Semitism to build hatred of queer people. When they say that Jews are introducing Muslims to Western society to destroy Western civilization. They're using Islamophobia to build hatred of Jews and anti-Semitism to build hatred of Muslims. The people who killed 11 people at a synagogue in Pittsburgh and 50 people at a mosque in Christchurch believe this anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. So what do we do to fight it? If you talk to any Holocaust survivor, the first thing is don't be a bystander. Call it out, call it in, educate your community. Two, two don't tolerate fascism. fascism. Join your local anti-fascist group. Join other groups that are organizing debates racism. Three, we are doing stuff to combat anti-Semitism in the Green Party. We've had motions to conference, we'll be running more education sessions, do support these efforts, and I'm sure we'll talk more later about how. And finally, don't let anybody get left behind. For Jews to truly be free for anti-Semitism, we need queer people to be free of transphobia and Muslims to be free of Islamophobia. We need to be free of free from anti-Black, anti-Asian and anti-traveler racism. We need to tear down the racial capitalist system that, of which anti-Semitism is a big part. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's, that was really, really, really interesting. And I'm still still kind of reeling from the statistic you, um, you gave us at the beginning of that, that there's such a high percentage um, in that survey. So that's, that's really, really shocking. Um, but thank you so much. And I hope people found that um, informative and, and thought provoking. Uh, we're going to we're going to move on um, to our next speaker, who is uh, Ria from the LGBTIQA plus uh, Greens. I think again you might need unmuting uh, Ria, who's going to talk to us a little bit about uh, queerphobia and transphobia. Hi everyone, um, thank you all for coming, and thank you to the Young Greens for having me here. 
So yeah, I'm going to be talking about queerphobia and transphobia. So what is queerphobia? So queerphobia is referring to any kind of bigotry directed towards LGBTIQA plus people. Um, and it doesn't seek to label all LGBTIQA plus people as queer um, because queer may still be seen as a loaded term um, to some people, but it is kind of an umbrella um, term used to refer to any kind of bigotry directed to any individuals within the LGBTIQA plus community. And so there are other terms as well. So lesbophobia, homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, interphobia, acephobia. And these are bigot these refer to bigotry faced by particular communities within the LGBTIQ plus umbrella. And all of these terms are equally valid to use. So we would like to propose the definition um, of queerphobia um, taken from um, adapted from many resources that we put together um, as queerphobia is a prejudice, prejudice against the whole or a section of the LGBTIQA plus community or someone that is perceived to be part of the LGBTIQA plus community. It is based on the perception that a person or a group of people's sex, gender, identity, gender expression or any kind of attraction, sexual, romantic, etc. For people of certain genders or gender, including non-attraction, is invalid, harmful, or abnormal. So this working definition encompasses a lot of things. It is encompassing all different kinds of prejudice. Um, it encompasses all of the more specific communities within the LGBTQ plus community. And some examples of this may be taking the actions of one or a few LGBTQ plus people to represent the entire community. Um, claiming that there is a conflict between the human rights of the LGBTIQ plus community and those of any other group. Um, both groups can have human rights without um, having either um, disrupted. Um, another example may be that implying being non-LGBTIQ plus is normal or natural in any way that being LGBTIQ plus isn't. Being queer, being trans is a normal and natural thing. There are many examples within the animal kingdom um, of these instances. Um, it is a natural phenomenon. Um, another example might be saying that an LGBTIQ plus person is confused following a trend or doing it for attention. Um, Transactual has lots of great um, information on this. If you want to find out more about kind of the nuances or definitions or any examples. But now I'm going to move on to talk about why it's on the rise. So why is transphobia on the rise? Why is queerphobia on the rise? I'd like to propose it's because the visibility of queer and, and trans individuals is increasing. It's not because there are more queer or trans people, it's because the visibility of us is increasing. Trans people, queer people have always existed throughout all of time, but now we're being seen in the media more frequently. Um, we're being seen on television, we're being seen in articles, we're allowed to be more active. We're allowed to have the same rights as other people, which may make us more visible. Um, Section 28 has been repealed um, and although the devastating effects of Section 28 still do exist, it did allow for more freedom of queer individuals. Um, it being lifted did. Um, but transphobia has changed more recently. It's become a bit more different um, now than in the past. For example, in the media, even though it all comes from the same place. It's also important to note that people's experiences of transphobia do differ from individual to individual. So trans men experience different types of transphobia to trans women. 
non-binary people and all of this more specific non-binary identities um, experience different kinds of transphobia if they choose to identify as trans. And it's also vitally important that we acknowledge the media's role in transphobia. The media across the board um, has become a vile mechanism for out, um, outputting transphobia and kind of making it normal, even though it's not. Um, it kind of normalizes it in people's minds in the narratives that they tell and it makes it seem acceptable for people to use this awful rhetoric, even though this is not acceptable at all. And it's media across the board. So you'll see it in left wing newspapers as well as right wing newspapers. It's not something that is kind of just for the left. It's not something that's just for the right. It's across the whole board. And I think the media really does play a really horrible role and they need to take accountability for that. And transphobia, queerphobia interacts with Islamophobia and anti-Semitism. Trans people exist across the board, across the world, and people have multiple intersecting identities. You can be queer and Muslim. You can be queer and Jewish. Um, you can have many other identities on top of that. Um, unfortunately, like Josh mentioned, there are lots of different conspiracy theories, which are all very false. For example, one you may have heard of is with trans people and anti-Semitism in relation to Big Pharma, that trans people only exist to fuel or line the pockets of Jewish people by um, contributing to the need for um, puberty blockers or any other kinds of medication or hormones, etc. Which is obviously not the case and is something that shouldn't exist and is a complete conspiracy theory, but this is one way in which it does interact. And then a really important thing we need to um, acknowledge is that because trans people exist across the board and imperialism did exist and still continues to exist because we have leftover attitudes and kind of left over kind of normalizations within society from imperialism and the effects of colonialism. Um, kind of Eurocentric worldviews are seen to be the normal views now, even though across the globe, so many different gender diversities did exist, genders and diversities did exist. They are kind of very common. Um, there's a wonderful map that I have, um, and I don't know if I'll be able to share it with you after, but it kind of highlights the number of places across the world that there are, so, there is so much diversity. You have hijras in India who were, who I think are used as kind of the most common example, um, but they were kind of, a third gender within India who are held as kind of uh, a high, as a kind of a high kind of group within society. Um, but because of kind of colonialism and the gender binary that Eurocentric views like to enforce, the Hydras were unfortunately put down and kind of not kind of kept on the same level of privilege that they had before. Um, they lost the humanity kind of, um, their humanity. Um, and the effects of this is still left over in today's culture and in India, which is really, really unfortunate because there used to be these wonderful people who would grant and do these um, amazing things for really important events. So how do we fight back? So more generally, we would love to see support and solidarity from our allies. Um, education, as Josh was saying before, education is key. Um, speaking to people 
about what queer phobia is, what transphobia is, and calling it out when you see it happening. Um, if you see someone using the wrong pronouns, correcting them, for example. And encouraging conversations about social justice is really important too. Um, both outside of the party, but also within the party. The Green Party is not just for environmental and ecological justice. We stand for social justice too. It's in our policies. It's within our kind of structure and we need to talk about this. Um, and it's not just the Green Party, it's all parties that are struggling with this currently, um, with the, the transphobia and queer phobia. Um, and that needs to be tackled. But how do you do that within a party? So what we need is to have a definition of what queer phobia and what transphobia um, is. And so what we've done is we've put together a motion. Um, unfortunately, it was ruled out of order, but it would be great to have a definition and get support for the motion and get the party to adopt it. Because with the definition, you are able to tackle the the transphobia um, within the party, but also set an example to society. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Again, a really, really interesting talk. And yeah, thank you so much for, for, for delivering that to us. And we'll make sure that the, the map that you reference, we'll make sure that that is accessible to people um, some point after the, the event, we'll get that circulated. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Um, we're going to move on to our third and final um, speaker, and then we'll move on to, to questions towards the end. Um, who is Maruf from the uh, from Greens of Colour? Uh, talk to us about Islamophobia again. I think Maruf you might be unmuted. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all those who have attended this evening. My name is Maruf Rav. I am a teacher, a husband, and a proud father, and I'm a Green Party candidate for local elections in May of this year. I would like to start by thanking the Young Greens and Greens of Colour allowing me a platform tonight to talk about Islamophobia. Islamophobia is rooted in racism and is the type of racism that targets expressions of Muslimness or perceived Muslimness. In the shadows of the Brexit vote and a new movement towards nationalism, the UK has seen a significant increase in the number of hate crimes against Muslims in the past few years. A week after the Christchurch mosque attacks in New Zealand in 2019, the number of reported hate crimes against Muslims in the UK soared by hundreds of percentage points. These incidents often saw white males making gun gestures at Muslims in the streets or shouting obscenity towards those who appeared to be Muslim. In more extreme cases, mosques and people were physically targeted. This reaction after the Christchurch attack followed the same pattern that occurred after the Manchester Arena bombing. In the week following that attack, there was a near 700% rise in the number of reported hate crimes against Muslims. Evidently, the rise in hate crimes after the New Zealand attack suggests that this kind of atrocity is further emboldening hate rather than helping forge a sense of solidarity with those who have been innocently killed. While there is undoubtedly a link between terror attacks and the rise of anti-Muslim sen sentiment in the UK, it is also something that many believe is being fueled by irrational fears amongst the middle class. Many experts have noted that despite the liberal shifts in public attitudes, openly racist and Islamophobic behavior has become more subtle and is practiced more often in the setting of middle class dinner tables. Statistics also prove that many people still see Islam in an unfavorable light, as 18% of people in the UK hold very negative views of Muslims. Accordingly, 44% of the UK public believes Islam is a grave threat to Western civilization, while 31% of people are convinced Islam is a threat to the British way of life, compared to 32% of people who think Islam is compatible, compatible with the British way of life. The main reasons for this negative outlook of Muslims stems from the fear that Islam would threaten British values, laws, and freedom of speech. It has been reported that 41% of people in the UK think that Islam threatens the British way of life because 
Islam breeds intolerance for free speech and calls for violent actions against those who mock, criticize, or depict the religion in ways they believe are offensive. Moreover, 36% of people thought that Islam threatens their way of life because Islam seeks to replace British law with Sharia law. Those who perceive multiculturalism and immigration negatively tend to be the most likely to hold anti-Muslim prejudices. Simultaneously, those anti-Muslim outlooks come from negative, sorry, come from different places. Amongst those with more negative opinions, there are claims of far-right race substitution conspiracies that Muslim populations have a higher population growth rate than non-Muslims and will make the white British demographic a minority. There are also unfounded fears that the Muslim community in the UK is directly linked to radical global terrorism, which perpetuates these fears. Nonetheless, the tendency for the middle class to be Islamophobic isn't confined to just one side of the political spectrum. A substantial anti-Muslim bias has also been found amongst left-leaning people who have more tolerant and liberal outlooks. It was reported that 25% of people who read The Guardian, a liberal left-wing editorial, believe that Islam is a great, grave threat to Western civilization, whilst 14% consider Islam a threat to the British way of life. Another 18% of those liberal Guardian readers believe that there are no-go zones in the UK, where Sharia law dominates and non-Muslims are not able to enter. A claim that even Donald Trump perpetuated. Liberals that hold anti-Muslim views justify their fears by arguing that the tendency for Islam to oppress and disregard women's and girls' rights threatens the British culture. This singling out of Islam as anti-feminist tends to be a critical factor in fueling Islamophobia within the liberal middle class. Nevertheless, there are challenges amongst Muslim communities in tackling misog misogyny, like in other societies of the world. However, it has become a common assumption amongst many liberals that all Muslim women need to be liberated from their culture, which is a biased notion drawn from colonial and orientalist narratives. Polling undertaken by the independent shows Muslims are less likely than Christians or Hindus to believe that feminism is making men feel marginalized and demonized in society. Indeed, Islamophobic attitudes are found across the political spectrum and are not solely derived from one group of people. To the extent that hatred is present amongst the uneducated working class, it is also present, perhaps, in more sinister forms amongst educated and liberal communities. The sooner the UK can acknowledge the broad spectrum of Islamophobia, the sooner the country can begin to unite against it. The normalization of Islamophobia has long passed the dinner table test. It now presides in such banter as ridiculing Muslim women's dress to draw parallels with letterboxes and bank robbers. And in political disputes that are aggravated using glib tropes of suicide vests. The continuation of Islamophobia in everyday bigoted discourse has fallen. It is more alarm, sorry, Bigoted discourse is not only indicative of how low the threshold has fallen, it is more alarmingly evocative of it spreading to the point of evincing conscious and unconscious biases against Muslims. It is not just British Muslims who are impacted by Islamophobia, it is British society at large, every single one of you, who by virtue of normalized prejudice against Muslim beliefs and practices come to imbibe a panoply of falsehoods or misrepresentations and consequently discriminatory outlooks to the detriment of social harmony and social inclusion. No matter how much documentary evidence there is of the discriminatory outcomes faced by Muslims, whether that be in employment, in housing, in education, in the criminal justice system, 
in social and public life and in political or media discourse, none of it can ever satisfy our desire to reverse these scandalous results if we cannot begin from the point of an agreed definition. A definition is important. A definition is needed. And the APPG definition is a definition that has had widespread consultation with academics, lawyers, local and nationally elected officials, Muslim organizations, activists, campaigners, and even local Muslim communities. The motion put forward for spring conference was for the <coughs> Green Party to accept the APPG definition as follows. Islamophobia is rooted in racism and is a type of racism that targets expressions of Muslimness or perceived Muslimness. The aim of putting forward a working definition of Islamophobia for the spring conference, which unfortunately was ruled out of order, was neither motivated by nor was intended to curtail free speech or criticism of Islam as a religion. Criticism of religion is a fundamental right in an open society and is enshrined in the commitment to freedom of speech. In fact, I encourage all of you to look at all religions and look at criticisms that you may have of them. In fact, I encourage anyone who wants to, to openly have a debate regarding the merits of Islam as a religion, but under no circumstances should the victimization of Muslims through the targeting of expressions of Muslim to Muslimness to deny or impair their fundamental freedoms and human rights be accepted by you, by the Green Party at large, or by British society at large. You can help. You can help by challenging Islamophobia and not letting it become normalized in everyday discourse. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that, for that talk. And I think that's, you know, the three, the three speakers we've had um, this evening have really um, summed up kind of the, the crux of the issue that we're here to discuss. So thank you for that final speech and thank you to, to all of our speakers. I apologize. I think you can hear my dog drinking in the background. <laughs> so um, we're going to move on to questions. So we've got a couple of questions already, but feel free to keep sending questions um, over to, to Rosie um, and we can, we can work through those. Um, but I think let's start with what we've got. And then um, if more come through, we can we can work through those. Um, I want to start with this one. And I think what we'll do is if we do, um, if I kind of give each person an opportunity to talk, so we've got some some mute, some, uh, mute sorry, buttons to deal with and stuff. So let's go with um, with that. I'll try and change the order so that, you know, the same person isn't picking on their feet every time. <laughs> so our first question, um, which I think we'll start with, is uh, some members see these liberation politics as distractions from the real issues. How can we uh, counter these uh, these criticisms and bring people with us? So, um, if we start with uh, start with Joshua, because you've you've yeah you started first um, before, so we'll start with Joshua and then we'll we'll move through. Um, yeah, I think Joshua, I'm muting again. Sorry. Yeah, no, so that's a really good question. I think it's about. It's about embedding anti-racism and anti-Semitism and anti-anti-Semitism as a part of that um, within every all of our organizing. I think and really embedding political education as well. That there will be lots of people who come to the Green Party who don't know terribly much, who come for environmental reasons or come because they really like a housing policy and don't know much about queerphobia or anti-Semitism or Islamophobia. And that in some ways is okay. We can't know everything about everything. What's important is to make our party into a place where learning can happen, where people can learn more about different intersecting forms of 
of oppression and how they connect to climate change or uh, criminal justice policy or that sort of, or even our international policies. And I, so I think embedding education is really important. And, you know, I agree with what the other speakers have said that ensuring we as a party have clear definitions and clear guidance for what we think these oppressions look like is really important. Um, so I would, yeah, run, run education events and keep organizing around, keep organizing on the intersections on, you know, the intersections of climate change and racial justice and workers' rights and um, trans rights and keep organising, keep thinking about the intersections, organising both universally and on the, and on the intersections and um, yeah, ensure education's really embedded within the party. Brill, thank you. Um, do you, uh, Ria, do you want to, to add to that? Um, if not, or, uh, or Maru, um, you might be not muting again, sorry. Yeah, I think I'd highlight what Joshua was touching on at the end, which is that environmental justice and social justice are so interlinked. You cannot achieve one without the other. You won't get the environmental justice you want without challenging transphobia without challenging Islamophobia, without challenging anti-Semitism and all other forms of bigotry and prejudice and all of the other horrible kind of racist um, ideologies certain people hold. You need to kind of make sure that people aren't complicit in it within the party, but you need to challenge it as well. And in order to do this, we need definitions, for example, because transphobia is systemic. All of the things we've spoken about are systemic issues and we need systemic change to challenge them. And in order to have environmental justice, you need to have this systemic change because trans people, people of color, um, Jewish people, Muslims, they will all be significantly more affected by climate change than white people, than cis people, than um, Christians, for example. You need to really tackle the systemic issues we have in society in order to understand and achieve environmental justice, because otherwise you're gonna have disproportionate effects of climate change for certain members in society over others. Thank you. Um, Maruf, do you want to add anything to that one, um, to those answers? I, I think Maruf might need a meeting. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think uh, Ria makes a very, very good point there about environmental justice and social justice being so, so interlinked and intertwined that at the end of the day, we should be proud as, as Green Party members, as, as just individuals, as human beings, we should be proud to challenge those who do not respect others. When someone is being Islamophobic or transphobic or anti-Semitic, we, we should be proud to challenge those views and actually say, you know what? What you are doing is wrong. What you are saying is wrong. And actually, it's not distracting, no. No, I told you, it is not a distraction from the real issue. Because these are real issues. To you, they might not be real issues, but someone being Islamophobic or Islamophobia is a real issue to me. So I think people really need to think about the way they put forward some of these questions about the real issues. Because, you know, to Rhea, someone being transphobic to Rhea is, is a real issue, or someone being anti Semitic to, to Josh is a real issue, someone being Islamophobic to me is a real issue. So, and they should be real issues. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you for that response. And I think that's a, a really interesting um, point, kind of linking it to, to, to real issues and to, to people. And it kind of kind of links to another question that I think we've, we've just got in, which um, if I'm having to ask, and I'm, I'm going to ask Ria first, but if um, people kind of want to, to say anything afterwards, that's, that's good. 
Um, we've got, uh, on the topic of transphobia, um, this question reads, I was just wondering uh, if you have any thoughts on the rise of the discussion of gender as a philosophical debate, questions such as uh, what is gender or how it, can be um, how it can be determined, which displaces the political discussion, so how, uh, how, uh, how trans rights can be secured, for example. So how can we uh, counter to recenter the more uh, important political discussions like securing um, trans rights? Again, Rhea might need unmuting again, sorry. Thank you. Um, so I would start off by saying, listen to trans people about trans issues. Um, trans people have the experience they have lived experience of being trans. They know what rights they're lacking because they don't have them and they can see other people have those rights. So listen to what trans people are saying. Um, Prioritise their voices over cis people's voices in certain situations because they will have the expertise because of simply being trans. Um, and kind of we need to focus on the kind of trans rights rather than the philosophical debate about what gender is because gender is whatever the person says they define it as um it's not kind of something for you to say oh they're non-binary oh they're a man they're a woman you can't say that you can however give people rights um to make people's lives better and that should be the priority over kind of trying to decipher what gender someone is and um, what kind of constitutes a specific gender. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a, that covers the, covers the question. And we've got um, kind of on top of that, which I'll, I'll kind of um, aim at uh, Joshua and, and Maruf and Eva can answer first, whoever wants to, to go, you know, it's an unmuting. But it kind of goes on the, the idea of how can we counter the debate over uh, religion being conflated with, again, with political discussion about uh, rights and prejudices um, on a similar kind of similar vein. Um, I'm not sure who'd like to, who'd like to go first, but uh, Maruf and Joshua might need unmuting again. I, I can go first. Yeah. I think the, the, the answer to that question really will be is actually we just, we just need to be respectful of all people, uh, whether they're Muslim, Jewish, uh, may, uh, sorry, gay, lesbian, uh, trans, you know, we need to be respectful of everyone. And, uh, you know, I agree, it's, it's important to be able to criticise and to question uh, and to have those debates, but they need to be done at the right time and in the correct context. And just coming, coming up with uh, criticisms in the, in the middle of the street is, is not the right time. It's not the correct context. You know, there needs to be a platform for it so people can have their say and be able to criticize openly, but also those responding sh should be able to respond, be able to have a chance to respond as well. Perfect, thank you. Um, Joshua, do you, want to, do you want to add to that at all? Yeah, no, I think it's important to note that that criticism, Islamophobia and anti-Semitism aren't really criticisms of religion. That there is nothing in the Jewish religion that even mentions space lasers. Um, there's nothing, it's anti-Semitism and Islamophobia are almost always criticisms of religious groups because of something they're not rather than because of something they are. Um, and so they're, that's why they're both located as types of racism rather than sort of philosophical comparative discussions of religion. I mean, it's, you can have a comparative religious discussion in the right context, but anti-Semitism and Islamophobia are not. I think freedom generally, it's important to respect people's right to be different and right to think differently. Yeah. Um. Oh, perfect, thank you. 
yeah, I think that that um, again covers the kind of question about how we how we um, separate the kind of more um, philosophical kind of debates from from political discussion. I think that was really interesting for you, from everyone. So thank you. Um, another question that we've got, um, which um, I'll try and change up the order that I ask people to, to answer because I realise I don't want the same people thinking on their feet every time. We've got, um, it says, I agree with Josh that uh, the Green Party should be somewhere people can learn about these uh, these areas and how they intersect with all our struggles. Uh, how can we create a space for people to learn and ask questions uh, when tensions are sometimes high within the party? Um, if I go to Ria first, if that's okay. Oh, you might have a meeting, sorry, my bad. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I think events like these are a clear example of somewhere where we can have a kind of open discussion. It's not quite a discussion, but you can still hear from people's voices and their opinions and ask questions to learn more. I think um, attending conference events attending other events hosted by liberation groups. Um, you can do a lot more than I think you can, We like you can do a lot more than you think you can do, if that makes sense. So there are opportunities to ask questions um, at so many different kinds of events that kind of may not be specifically linked to one of these issues, but it would be good to challenge and ask kind of, how does this tie into this? Have you thought about this um, within different contexts? Um, because all of these issues are systemic issues, like I was saying. So they tie into so many different areas of society. Um, yeah. No, perfect, thank you. Um, I think that covers it. Uh, Joshua, do you wanna add anything to, to that? Yeah. Now, I think that's a really good question. And I think, obviously, as Ria mentions, education events are really important. But also, as long as you're starting off from positions of mutual respect, organising together is one of the like best ways to build relationships, build understanding, and build greater knowledge and build collective liberation. So we can all we can all organize around particular issues. We can organize in unions, we can organize in tenants' unions, we can organize here in the Green Party to win elections. But organize together and ask ask respectful questions about people's experiences and people's knowledge. And I know this, like, might, this might just be my particular background, but like, there's never anything wrong with doing a bit of reading. Um, or if, films or YouTube videos are more your thing, doing that. But yeah, it doesn't have to, you don't have to come and listen to me to learn about anti-Semitism. That there's lots of fantastic resources out there to learn. And you don't, you don't have to listen to me or listen to other Jewish people to seek those out. So firstly, educate, secondly, organize, and thirdly, I guess, educate the Perfect. Um, and um, Ruf, do you have anything to, to add to that one? I realize it's been- Yes, uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, I think Josh makes some uh, good point there about, you know, respect and uh, educate yourself. I think um, it's, it's important, you know, I'm a, I'm a firm believer of it being imp important to ask questions. If you don't understand, you know, ask questions, and it's good to ask questions. Um, but, um, you know, spaces such as conference, events, workshops, are spaces for people to learn and ask questions when tensions are high. I mean, we, we've got this event on today, and, you know, the amount of people that signed up and the amount of people that are actually on the call uh, are two different numbers. You know, if everyone turned up today, we'd, we'd have a lot more people that could actually 
benefit from from the space we have today to ask questions and to learn about Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, and uh, and transphobia. Um, I have lived experience of Islamophobia. How can someone who has never experienced it tell me it does not exist? So you know that that that's why we're here, and it, it's important to acknowledge that we all make mistakes. You know. It is, it is within the range of possibilities that language one uses to express themselves can actually be interpreted correctly as a slight, as insensitive or as an unintentional attack. And if that is the case, own it. It's important to be able to own it. And whether that's myself or someone else is to own it and realize actually, you know what? You, what you may have said may have offended someone. Um, and it's important to acknowledge the correctness of a viewpoint that isn't yours. Be just because you have a viewpoint of something, if you have, haven't had lived experience of it, how can you say whether something exists or not? And being a owning those mistakes doesn't lessen your original position. It just simply makes space for another equally valid one. And it's good to have people today here to be able to ask those questions. Use these platforms. You know, I encourage everyone here today to join more events and workshops and use these platforms and ask questions. Ask questions about Islamophobia or anti-Semitism or transphobia or any, any other um, phobia that might be out there. Uh, ask questions. How else are you supposed to learn? Absolutely. Uh, no, absolutely. Thank you so much. And, and you know, on, on our part, um, as has been said by all we're ready, we're, you know, really thrilled that we can, um, we can facilitate this space, but there are so many, so many events at conference, uh, you know, in more general hosted by liberation groups. And so I think there's so many opportunities to, uh, to have sort of similar discussions and, and to, to learn and educate uh, yourselves. Uh, I'm going to try and squeeze in a couple more questions, um, if I can. Um, I've got one uh, for, uh, for Josh, so I'm going to Gonna, it's quite long, so apologies. Um, but uh, this question says, I agree with you that anti-Semitism is often used uh, to cover up for capitalism's failures uh, and socioeconomic inequalities. In the late 19th century, the German uh, socialist, I'm putting myself a name here, August uh, Bebel, uh, denounced anti-Semitism as the socialism of fools. Left-wing groups denounce capitalism, so why would they need or use anti-Semitism for this? But a, a fantastic question and I think I think it's I it's when when Bebel talked about the socialism of booze he meant that anti-semitism sometimes sometimes functions as a sort of when people are for teaching capitalism but haven't got all the way there. And there's a point with some types of anti-Semitism where they've nearly got it right. Like there are a small group of people in society who are unaccountable, who have a lot of the money, who have a lot of the power. But these are not the Rothschilds or the Jews. These are the rich, right? Um, and so some, yeah, they're often these are people who have to some extent a critique of capitalism or a critique of imperialism, but they haven't got all the way there. And I think some, this is something that we can organize around. Relatively quick, so I'll go around um, again with this one. Um, this one, again, quite a long one. So if, yeah, if we can, we can try and um, answer this. It says, um, it kind of ties into what Josh, uh, Josh was just saying. I think to solve these problems, uh, we need to understand the root causes uh, of them. Uh, why, and sorry, and why people turn to discrimination and conspiracy uh, theories against groups of people. Uh, is it that they are easier to blame than the real and complex problems of the world and or for a sense of community against a common enemy, um, a sense of kind of community lacking in current society? Uh, how do we tackle these, uh, these root causes and how do we prevent them becoming a problem in the first place? I guess it's quite a long one. Um, if I start with uh, Maru. Um, yeah, pe people attack. Attack. Um these ideas because because 
they're, they're the minorities and it's much easier to attack minorities who may not have uh, have the the backing of the majority to be able to fight those uh, fight those attacks. Uh, that's the answer to the first part. Um, um, the second part of the question: uh, How do we tackle these root causes? Uh, by by listening, by by listening to those lived experiences. You know, I've experienced Islamophobia. I've been called a Muslim prick, and I've been called a Paki bastard, and I've been called all these all these different things about you know my race, my religion, and all these things. Listen to the experiences of those who've suffered, and you may get just a tiny glimpse of what you know it it feels like to to go through go through these uh, uh, these events and uh, like the, these attacks. And you know, it, if you get a glimpse of that, you might actually realize, you know what? If we banded together and if we joined together and we, if we became allies and if we fought this uh, this disease of Islamophobia, uh, then then we might actually get rid of it from society. But unfortunately, at this moment in time, uh, people aren't banding together and people aren't becoming allies. And you know, it's it's being allowed to spread. So the answer to that question is listen and join the cause to fight Islamophobia. Thank you. Um, Ria, do you want to, to add anything to that or, or Josh? Yeah, I think, why do people turn to discrimination? Um, so I think what Marufa was saying is actually really, really key. So because we are minorities, it's easier to attack us. It's easier to kind of have more power over people who have less power, right? And tackling this kind of power structure is important. And how else do we prevent it? We can look at how different layers of intersectionality kind of intersect and layer on top of each other. Like black trans people are far more likely to be victims of harassment and discrimination. Even though 50% of trans people say they have experienced assault at some point in their life it's but when you add on another layer it gets more complex right and so all of these different identities all intersect to form this one person and all of the different kind of kind of racism and the transphobia builds up and leads to further discrimination and it's easy for people to turn to discrimination when they are the majority, when they have the privilege, when they have all of the rights that others don't have. And so to tackle root causes of it, we need to stand together. I mean, that's the name of this event, isn't it? United We Stand. So join us, stand together, call it out, call out racism, call out Islamophobia, call out anti-Semitism, transphobia, queerphobia, when you see it and educate yourselves. That's something I meant to say earlier as well educate yourself, Google, Google stuff. It's free, do it. Um, yeah, thank you. No, thank you, thank you. And I think that's, that message is coming through so clear from, from all of our speakers to, to educate um, educate yourselves, listen to people, but also, also self-educate. Um, Josh, did you want to add anything to that one? Yeah, I'd also say we've got to like take this, we've got to take this back to sort of the legacy of imperial racism, right? The, for generations and centuries, like these racial prejudice has been at the heart of like the way in which we've organized society and also like heteropatriarchy has been at the heart of the way we organize society. And so is it easier to blame minorities? Yes, in a lot of ways it is because people have been like taught that through like generations of colonial racism and to begin to question that it might you might have to turn your critical gaze on yourself and the stuff you might believe or have internalized or learned and so I as with like so many things, I think 
why is it easy? It comes, it comes back to imperialism and colonialism at the at the end of the day, is like that's we're still we're still very much a colonial society in a lot of ways. No, definitely. That's a really, really interesting, um, really interesting thought to finish that that question on. Um, I'm going to ask uh, one more question, uh, which is specifically for uh, Ria, and then um, we will start to, to wrap up. And again, it's quite a long one, so I, I do apologise. And if I <laughs> if you lose the thread of what I'm saying, uh, do let me know. Um, it says for Ria, uh, why do you think so many people uh, can bemoan the sins of the past uh, in regards to things like Section 28, uh, lack of equal marriage, the AIDS crisis? Uh, and so on, whilst in the same breath uh, being on the wrong side of history in regards to the trans community. How can people be so awake to historical prejudice while remaining at best blind to and at worst actively uh, actively propagate, uh, propagating um, in, in the present day uh, prejudice uh, against trans people? Uh, and how do we help people to see the contradiction here? Mm, that is a really key question, I think. Um... So we all know that Section 28 was damaging, very, very damaging. The effects lasted last till today. And I think it's quite interesting when you look at the parallels between transphobia and homophobia. Um, and you, you can see that history is somewhat replaying itself, but I guess in a more nuanced way with relation to transphobia, but it, history is replaying itself. Um, when you think of kind of being gay um, when Section 28 was introduced, you'd think, oh, it was kind of a hush-hush kind of thing. Um, you might think there were like a lot of conspiracy theories around being gay. Um, the fact you could almost catch it from kind of being near someone. Um, it's the fact that it was a disease, um, a mental illness. And some of these things are still kind of parallel in transphobia. Um, it's something that needs to be cured. Conversion therapy is still legal in the UK. Um, transphobia needs to be cured by conversion therapy is a narrative you hear. Um, not commonly, but it still does exist. And maybe not as overtly, but covertly indeed. And a lot of these parallels are very present. So I'd say, look at section 28, look at the past, look into history and see what kind of challenged your thoughts about homophobia then. And look now at transphobia and ask yourself, why haven't you challenged yourself yet? And what am I going to challenge myself on to make sure that transphobia is more, is more kind of, it's easier to speak out against transphobia basically is what I'm trying to say make it easy to speak out make it easy to tackle and make sure that trans people get the rights that they deserve and get the same rights and recognition that um, gay and queer people were able to get um, even though there's some more rights that we need but and more advances we need but um, yeah that's the main kind of point Thank you so much. I think it's such a such a pertinent question. Thank you for answering it so uh, so fully. And yeah, thank you. I think um, everyone really really appreciates that. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna start to to wrap up. But I wanted to to focus on um, just for a moment. Um, it's been mentioned by by all three of the speakers these these motions at um, a conference, which is uh, early next month. And uh, the three motions that have been been referenced are out uh, definitions for uh, queerphobia, Islamophobia, and antisemitism. Um, and as has been been mentioned, they were ruled out of order. Um, and if I if I'm good to if I just um, pass over to uh, Joshua, can you sort of just um, sum up a little bit more about what these motions are, um, what they're ruled out of order, and how we can um, how how people can help um, get these these motions to conference? Yeah, sure. So effectively, we for each of our groups proposed a motion. A conference that helps helps do the help will help do the bits of explanation and the bits of education that we've been doing today but in written form and so we've got though we're taking those to conference 
and they unfortunately they got ruled out of order and this means that we will have to do a bit of amending reports and there'll be several votes one to amend the report and then votes and the motion, motions themselves. And yeah, I think each of these group, each group represented here tonight would like really love you to come to conference and um, to support, support and support those motions and those groups. Um, I've been asked in a private message to briefly say why they were ruled out of order. And apparently we use the wrong word in, a, in the wording of the motion. We said we should instruct, we said we should instruct a committee rather than suggest to a committee, which I would certainly think not a particularly meaningful change. Um, so that's why they were ruled out of order. But the important, I'm sure we'll send more details about closer to conference about like the votes and how we as liberation groups think that you should vote. But yeah, that's sort of one of the one of the reasons why um why we gathered, gathered all here tonight, um, among, among many others, of course. Brilliant, thank you. Thanks, Josh. And yeah, I think um, that's a, a really key message is, is A, sign up, sign up to conference, go to conference if you can. Um, and I hope that, um, you know, the event that we've, we've um, held and, you know, the speakers that we've had this evening um, have, have helped you um, to, to kind of discover some more and to, to start sort of some more education. Um, and to vote on these these motions uh, at conference. So um, a bit of a bit of wrap up from us. Uh, first of all, a huge thank you um, to our free speakers, um, to to Ria Marif and Josh from uh, the Free Liberation Groups. They've been wonderful, and I, I really hope uh, you've learned as much as much as I have, and have been you know taken as much away. Um, and you know, as as the Young Greens, we're we're really thrilled that we can we can host and facilitate this kind of space. So I really hope that this has been informative for people. Um, as uh, Young Greens tradition, and um, I'm now stealing slightly ironically Rosie's words, uh, we want to put words in your mouth. Um, so we've got a click to tweet, which is a link that will go in the chat in a second, I think. Yeah. Um, and you click it and it puts a tweet, a pre-written tweet, and you click tweet and you tell everyone to register to conference and that you've been to this event. Um, and it points as well to the, the social media of the Jewish, uh, the, I think Jewish Greens, the Greens of Colour, um, and the LGBTIQ plus greens. Um, so yeah, please do tweet that, share that. Um, and we really hope to, to see you at conference it would be wonderful. But um, apart from that, I think all we have is thank you and have a lovely evening. Thank you all. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Kelsey. <laughs> see you all soon.